Today's been quite funny. They thought I wasn't going to show up, and then I showed up, and they couldn't find me behind the curtain, so it's one of those days. Thanks so much for uh, making the time, and, and thanks so much for the invite. Um, you know, when I was preparing for this presentation in the Uber coming over here, I actually had a bit of a mind change and thinking I'm not going to do the usual. I'm actually going to talk about something that I've been thinking about, but I haven't really articulated on stage or in front of an audience before. And it's, I actually typed this in the car, what if customers are no longer humans, but rather algorithms? And what I want to do today is not give you this academic view of the world or opposite an 80,000 foot view of where things are going. I'm actually going to give you real practical examples. Uh, I believe the future is already here just unevenly distributed. You've heard that before. And I think when it comes to fourth industrial revolution, when it comes to artificial intelligence and all the, 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 the misnomers and the characterizations of it, I think we're already seeing it in technology today. It's not coming. Stuff's happening. And what I'll show you is personifications in the real world, and I'll try and translate it back to kind of the tertiary education sector and some posits from my perspective around what we need to be teaching students. I think... <sighs> Soft power is so much more important today than hard power. So, so much more important. In an age of artificial intelligence, it's not going to be about being the mathematician. It's not going to be about being the statistician or the actuarial scientist or the computer scientist or the engineer. What I'm discovering more and more, especially from a leadership perspective, is understanding humans more than you understand technology. And that's going to be the thing that I'm going to kind of posit quite often throughout this presentation. I think the greatest burden on leadership today, tertiary education institutions, uh, governmental institutions, private sector education, you name it. Every single one of you in leadership positions today, the burden on you is not to understand technology better, but to understand humanity more. Sustainability is not derived today from implementing great technological tools only. It's not about building things that are great. This notion of me, 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 me is changing. We're living in a world of we, 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 we. You know, when you had a large business in the Industrial Revolution, just going back 50 plus years, it was all about your size. Your size gave you your competitive edge. It was X amount of floors, people worked for you, big brand in the sky, all the kids coming out of university wanted to work for the neon light on that building, and they wanted to go to the first floor and then work their way all the way to the corner office at the very top. That's changed now. And it changed quite dramatically when we went from size, we went to what? This notion of looking at cultures, talking about information workers and dissemination of information. We said, wait, it's not just information, it's knowledge workers. Then we spoke about knowledge workers and we created this whole cultural movement associated with it, utilizing technological tools. And now the big, big thing that everyone talks about is collaboration. You've got to listen to our staff, You've got to listen to our customers. I want to posit today that your size is okay. Your information worker capability is okay. Your ability to take information, make a knowledge okay. Your ability to listen is okay. But sustainability is now derived from co-creativity. You gotta let us in. Artificial intelligence is not a term that is singular. Whenever someone talks about AI, now AI, it's not you know, 3D printing and all those other things under the fourth industrial revolution banner, it's okay. AI is the one that's this new energy. AI is this new electricity. AI is this new thing given to us, this gift that has been given to us. And artificial intelligence is the greatest superpower we have ever had. And we need to understand this very, very well. AI is not singular. AI is not Watson over there, you know, disseminating radiological information better than any radiologist. That is an AI. It's not Blue playing a chess against Kasparov, and we call that AI. That is an AI. Those are instances of singular implementations of a particular intelligence. It is not artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence should be, have an S at the end. It should be called artificial intelligences. The way we think about intelligence in the world is very linear. We think a squirrel knows where its nuts are after X amount of years. It's got a great memory. Therefore, it's got a certain level of IQ. You go to a chimpanzee, we say that's got a better IQ because of its more cognitive capabilities, right? Then you move over to a dumb person, and you say, well, that person has this IQ. Then you move to a normal person, and we say a genius. And we look at intelligence, and we say that's intelligence. But that's actually not intelligence. Intelligence is a coagulation. It's a coming together of disparate species of capabilities and competencies to deliver on a particular outcome. An organization is not a linear implementation of intelligence. It is disparate capabilities coming together to deliver a particular service. That is now being accentuated because we now have intelligence that is not bound by consciousness anymore. You know, I love what um, Yuval Nora said. He says that the, 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 this century will be defined by the decoupling of intelligence from human consciousness. And that's so true. And that decoupling requires some of us to understand 
what makes us human, and therefore give our organization fitness functions that are well thought through. Because when you give someone great superpowers, the Spider-Man quote, the Spidey Spidey quote, is right, with great power comes great responsibility. I think in the world today, we're seeing irresponsible power. We're seeing irresponsible outcomes of this superpower given. We're seeing fitness functions being given to organizations that are having dystopian outcomes. When I was at Google, you know what the fitness function of Google was? Relevance. When you come to Google, we try to deflect you away as quick as possible. And when you never come back, we like it. You come to Google search, you search for it, you click on a link and you never come back. We know our quality was high. We know our relevance was high. It, our fitness function was relevance. You go to Facebook, what's the fitness function of Zach? It's engagement. It sucks you in, holds you in, binds you, doesn't want to let you go. You click on a link, you don't leave, you're inside there. He's disseminating information, etc. But what we find as leaders, Google, Zuckerberg, we're now seeing a dystopian outcome associated with those fitness functions, right? And I think we need to be very careful because those are metaphors of what could potentially happen in our society when we employ these fitness functions incorrectly. And I think what we need to teach in tertiary education, every mathematical student needs to have exposure to the humanities. They need to have an exposure. When, when I was at, at Novell in the United States, I lived in the States for seven and a half years, I'll never forget this. And when we went over to the open source software movement, I saw that there. I saw something happening in the open source software movement that was very big. I had the responsibility to go and take a look at the open source software movement and determine how Noval could play in that strategically. I came back to the office and I said, this is not a technology story. It's not a technology story. It's a humanity story. And everyone looked at me and said, what do you mean? Well, I went to Harvard, sort of to MIT's campus, to go visit one of the open source software movement things. When I walked in, there was two people, Nat and Miguel. And inside the room, it was wall-to-wall -wall people. It was a movement that was a human movement. It wasn't a technological movement. This is not new. Free and open source software runs on every single one of your glowing rectangles on your laps. The people that made that technology that allows you to have the capability that you have today, they made it freely, they made it in their own time, and it gets shipped to you, co you know, combined. But human expression is already on your lap. That is not an organization that gave you that only. That is an ecosystem that delivered that particular device. When you wake up in the morning, you look at your glowing rectangle, what lays underneath that is not technology only. What lays underneath that is a substrate of human expression where people do things for free. And they do it freely because they want to. And I'm going to explain this, and we need to understand this better because I think this is the message. This is the consequence. This is the inference of for the fourth industrial revolution. Just assume AI is everywhere. Everyone is augmented. Now what? And I think that's what I want to posit today, and that's what I want to share. We need to let people in. It's not about building great core capability. Organic power is not sustainable in the fourth industrial revolution. It's inorganic power. It's taking what you have and opening it up so we can make it better, so we can reimagine it. And the greatest burden on every single leader's shoulders in the world today is to reimagine. You've got to reimagine every aspect of your services. You've got to reimagine yourself. You've got to relearn all the time. Take that all the way to a nation state. We have to reimagine ourselves as South Africa. We've got to reimagine ourselves as Africa. We've got to reimagine re ourselves as humanity. Because if we don't do this, a dystopian outcome is ultimately where we'll end up. And it is very, very, very possible. This notion of everyone not having jobs and everyone this, yes. I love what Tim O'Reilly says, though. He says, if we do land up where these machines and all this automation truly does disintermediate us, truly does take away all our jobs, it won't be because of the machines, it will be because of a lack of imagination on behalf of leadership in the world today. We don't need to have this. It doesn't need to lead to this. And that's some of the positives that I'll bring out. So just in terms of my track record, um, you guys know, I've, I've just mentioned Google. I did Thumbs Up, and then I did a little machine there called the Payment Blade, and now Gattaca and SnapTutor. And I just want to talk about those. What was very, very interesting about these, these startups that have now gone on to become international businesses um, that manufacture technology in South Africa and ship it globally is the following. What we discovered was we were doing things that we didn't imagine before. Right? I mean, a yuppie chef down there takes the payment blade and they go in from an online store and they opened up doors and suddenly they had an offline presence in Cape Town. They opened up three stores. But what's different when they opened up as a retailer coming from online to offline was they didn't have huge checkout counters where people had the jobs that we talk about today. 
right, with cash drawers and sitting there taking your credit card and swiping it for you. That does not work with dignity. But yet we fight for that. Because we are all subject today to a fitness function that a guy called Milton Friedman gave us in the early 70s. What did Milton Friedman say to Wall Street? He gave Wall Street a fitness function. He gave the superpower of that algorithm a fitness function. And what did he say? The sole responsibility of an organization is to derive value for its shareholders. That's what Milton Friedman gave, the fitness function of Wall Street. And today we're seeing that. We're seeing organizations with incredible productivity. And their operating margins just yawning because they are doing more with less. They are laying people off. But we are seeing organizations emerging that are doing more that was previously thought impossible with the human beings that they employ. Reimagining services. Think a look, of, look at Amazon for a second. Amazon has employed over 200,000 machines. Right? If I had to show you, I have a picture in the slide, so I'm not going to flick around, but there's a picture of an Amazon worker. Just 10 years ago, if I showed you that picture, it would be someone at wrist guards sitting on a little dolly with a little, you know, gir uh, the, 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 like this protector, core protector, and a big thing at the, on the side saying X amount of injur injuries that have not happened in the last X amount of days. That, do you fast forward to today. You see machines on the floor. You see humanity conducting and orchestrating disparate species of intelligences and deriving value out of a square meterage of warehouse space previously unimaginable. Amazon is not laying people off. Amazon in the last two years have employed over 200,000 more people. But he's delivering on services that were previously unimaginable. I was in New York not too long ago and I lost my cable for my, for my laptop. I ordered it on Amazon, I'm a Prime member. Less than 40 minutes, ding, ding, there was my cable at the door from the time I clicked pay. It's a service that was previously unimaginable. When you take humans out of what we call undignified work today and you le release us, you establish capability that was previously unimaginable and you give people, people jobs that have dignity. Our work is not to do things that are measured by efficiency and productivity. If we can measure the efficiency of productivity, a machine will do that and do it better than you because a machine can do it 24 by 7, 365, perpetually. You can't. You need leave. You get sick. You will never be as good as a machine. We need to release humanity. I think what the fourth industrial revolution promises us is to, is to free humanity from the jobs that we deem so relevant to us, that our identity is so melted up to, so we can do work that is meaningful. And that work is what type of work? It's work that wastes time. That's what we're meant to do. We're meant to do work that wastes time. Scientific research wastes time. It's predominantly failure. Right? It's you. You're not standing behind a donkey in a field putting hard labor down. A machine is now tilling the soil on our behalf. Now 98% of us don't work in agriculture. 98%, 2% of us work in agriculture, but we go to the supermarket and we eat tropical fruits in the depths of winter. We've moved from plows and human and, and, and animal power in fields to doing what? Recipes. Michelin chefs. Hors d'oeuvres. We've moved from making clothes and the labor of making clothes to automating it, and we fought the automation. We fought for those jobs, but what we couldn't imagine was what? Runways of fashion. As soon as you unleash us, and you unleash humanity's true capability, you establish more work once you take us away from these things that we call jobs that we fight for today. And that's the promise of it. But we could have a dystopian society, and we're already, we already subject to a rogue algorithm. We're already subject to leadership that's measuring operating margin, laying more people off. But we are seeing an emergence of businesses that are thinking about this very, very differently. I want to talk about something that's very, very real. It's one of my startups, and I'll get back into philosophical. This is a startup called Gattaca. Um, we are now in South Africa live. We are in Rotterdam. We are in London, and we've just gone live in New York built in South Africa. Um, this company emerged from the notion of uh, looking at retail. Now, I want to give you a, a real practical example of how AI is like really real. It's not like really coming. And it's not a thing. It's things. Okay. Um, I just don't, again, I'm going to keep coming back to it. Artificial intelligence says not artificial intelligence. As soon as you get into this like GPUs, big box in the sky, crunching big numbers, uh, you have uh, mischaracterized what is actually happening. Okay. 
It's not that. Artificial intelligence is not that thing only. Artificial intelligence is predominantly and more so disparate species of artificial intelligences symbiotically augmenting humanity to do things that was previously impossible. That's AI. The big number crunching machine from IBM and Huawei and all that, that's interesting, cool. Supercomputers and quantum computers at Wits University, cool, cool, cool. But that is not AI. That's not AI that's relevant to what we need to be thinking about. Because no matter who you are, and no matter what you make as a business, there are always smarter people on the outside of your business than on the inside of your business. That's a Bill Joy's law. There's a law called Bill Joy's law. Eh? He says that, and I'm paraphrasing. No matter who you are, no matter what you make, there are always smarter people on the outside, and more of them relative to the core of your business. Co-creativity requires you to unleash latent human capital outside your organizations within the context of your organizations to deliver on these services that were previously unimaginable. Now, here's an example. Here's a retailer, right? I walked into a retailer. I, when I left Thumbs Up, I'm still a minority shareholder. I retired for 18 months. I decided I've, I'm done, I'm tired, and I got back onto the field again. But um, what we did was I started shopping, and I kept, every time I shopped with my two-year-old, two-and-a-half-year-old Bella at the time, um, I kept on picking up there were products that went on the shelf that was on my shopping list. Really, really irritated me. And then I picked up that a retailer, any retailer in the world, think about them, they spend so much money on technology that allows you to check out and pay with people and tolls and cash points, right? Then you go past the dumb shelves that at best has pretty lights on it, and you go through the flappy doors at the back, and what do you see? Pallets of products orchestrated by some ERP application that costs them a billion rand. Yeah, Woolworths spends almost a billion rand on SAP. They spend almost a billion rand on their checkout infrastructure. But where you and I are, predominantly when we engage in that store, it's completely dead. The shelves are dead. So you know what we decided? We're going to inject artificial intelligence into retail shelves. We didn't know what it was going to be. We just said, well, why? let's do this. Let's try it. And this is what we did. So what we did is we first gave the shelf the capability to feel. You see that sliver? That over there? That sliver? That's a sliver of technology and computers and sensors in there. Essentially, it gives the shelf the capability to feel. Okay? It knows what's on it, it knows movement, and it knows temperature. We put weight sensors in it, quite a few things in there, with communicable capabilities, and suddenly, we changed it from just being a dead shelf, from being a shelf that knew X amount of vitamins are on me, and this type of vitamin is on me. Right? And uh, when you move things off it, it declares those movements, either replenishments or stock taking away, whatever may be happening on it, in real time through a nice mobile app. That was incredibly powerful when we did this. For the first, this was 18 months ago we did this. And people were like, wow, you can make a shelf feel. And we were, yeah. And you know what, guys, some of you, typically the guys, what do we do? We have the two liter Coke that we really want, and then we get like a little, and we shouldn't be drinking Coke, and we leave our two liter Coke on top of the vitamin tablets. <laughs> right? And then suddenly the vitamin tablets go from 100 on the shelf to 1,000 on the shelf. So we went, oh, God, oh, my God, this doesn't work, this doesn't work. So what we did was we put an eye at the back of the shelf. We said, nah, we're not going to put an eye. Let's give the shelf the capability to see. And that's what we did. You see that little camera there? That's a camera with a 170-degree viewing angle, fisheye lens, and suddenly we could see out. We augmented it and gave it a body with a tablet. But essentially, that allowed us to see. And when we started seeing, we said, whoa, we, let's start disseminating, and we built our own neural network. So we built a couple of machine learning modules that do facial analysis. So very, very good facial analysis. And we're not running our, our machine learning modules in the cloud because it's not economical to run over a sim like that. We're actually running behind here. There's quite a few computers. Let me just make it simplistic. For computers running there. And what it's doing is it's disseminating facial information. So we can see how many people are walking by. We can see how many people are looking. We can see how many people are dwelling. We can see how many people are interacting, picking up the product, looking and putting it back. We can see when you pick up and you walk away. We call that a conversion. We can see conversions, interactions, dwellings, views, and foot traffic. But you know, it's really powerful because we do facial analysis. We can see your gender. We can see your ethnicity. We can see your average age, and we can see your sentiment. Now, that's extremely powerful. And that we're doing at the shelf. And I imagine being able to disseminate real-time information like that. So this is what it looks like today if you're going to Discam Mall of Africa. You will see it looks like this. It's a little bit bigger. You see the camera is well hidden. Um, and you, when you walk up, if you're female and you walk up to this drop in this cam, all the data over here will start rendering female-based content. If you're male, it will start rendering male-based content. If you're a male, black male, you'll see the content's different from a Caucasian male. 
And that's not being done by a human. No, that's an AI. That AI is running on the shelf and disseminating this information. Extraordinarily powerful. We can start seeing trending and last. We're now combining it with big data. So we see climatological conditions and how they affect foot traffic in a store. We can see traffic patterns, how it affects. And we can keep going, keep going. We, now, this is, this is built in South Africa. This company is called Gattaca. We own the patent for this now. We filed it in quite a few ge geographies in the world. And it's being built here. And we've shipped it with Unilever to Rotterdam, to London, and it's running in New York. And we know we're the first of our kind doing it like this. There are people who are doing similar, but like this. Extremely powerful. It took us about 18 months to get to this point, to get an artificial intelligence engine or engines to run on here. Now, you know what we're introducing? And another artificial intelligence. Remember, it's a disparate species of intelligences, not just machine learning for facial recognition or, or analysis. You know what we're doing? We can see what you're wearing. We can see whether you're wearing makeup. We did it for Unilever. We put it at the ponds drop. We could see makeup density and colors. We can see earrings. We can see what type of watch you're wearing. We can see your clothing category types. We can see whether you're with people. And we can see generally when you buy, you, people that buy Biomune wear Under Armour. <laughs> and we correlate the two and we say, hey, there's something up here. So we can do joint marketing campaigns or so change our planograms. Now, this is incredible because the planogram of a store will become different. Suddenly you walk in a store and you'll see things that are very, very relevant and they'll be cheaper too. Because you know what? When things move off here, the replenishment year will be in real time because we're telling something in the back to move things forward. We're orchestrating an entire supply chain by injecting artificial intelligence enabled real time information, not big data. I love what IBM says. Big data doesn't help you when you need to cross a highway blindfolded. You can't cross a highway blindfolded with information three seconds old. <laughs> you don't want to ever do that. It's real time. And that's what AI does. AI takes the notion of time away. The internet took the notion of time away. Google struggles with this. Google is a business of today, whereas we are people of right now. When you open up your phone predominantly, where are you going? To websites and apps? No. You're going to streams of real-time information. You're going to feeds, Twitter feeds. You're going to Facebook walls. You're going to Instagram pictures. You are going perpetually to streams of human-disseminated content. You are not visiting static data. Time has been removed. And this is what's happening in organizations. And guess what? This scam, this retailer is not doing it. They're allowing us in to do it. This scam is allowing co-creativity to occur because they organically will never be able to do this. They don't have the skill sets. They don't have the DNA. They'll never be able to catch up. They're allowing us in to play around in their store to see what happens. Luckily, they know me and we know them, etc. We're doing this now in pick and pay. We're doing it in clicks, etc. Et Very, very powerful. The stuff's not coming, folks. The stuff's here. It's just unevenly distributed. Uh, I'll just, this is kind of how it looks, and this is the outcome. So we can see gender splits, age breaks down, ethnicity breakdowns. We can see male. You know what was interesting about this product? Just quick anecdotal information. They thought um, that uh, Biogen, Biomune, is a product predominantly bought by Caucasian females in their 40s. That's what their data gave them. Guess what? After six months, after three months of a campaign, we picked up that Biomune is a product predominantly bought 74 plus percent by black males. 35 and above. <laughs> and all their marketing content is, 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 is targeted at Caucasian human beings. Okay. Let's, let's move away from the, 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 the kind of the, this stuff and let's talk more, go back to the philosophical aspect of this. The stuff's not coming, the stuff's here. We keep bumping into this all the time. Okay, and, and again, don't underestimate it. I love this article and I, I always put it in my presentations. Um, where, you know, poor Tim Berners-Lee, when he spoke about the World Wide Web, and people say, like, what? World Wide Web? It's not going to go anywhere. Overestimate this stuff. You know, I always tell folks, when you take a look at a phone today, take a look at a phone. Right? I've got an iPhone 10 in my bag at the back there. That will be the prepaid entry-level phone in the prepaid market in the next 36 months in South Africa. Now work backwards. Right? People are becoming extraordinarily powerful. We are giving them ones, Harry Potter ones. And what's beautiful about it is, in Africa today, it's not just people getting connected to the internet. It's human beings gaining access to disparate species of artificial intelligences, and that makes them incredibly powerful. But let's keep going on that. So I'm going to put the slide in, because I'm just going to say Bitcoin, because every presentation I ever do, I say Bitcoin, and then I move on, because I have to. If I haven't, then none of you get your money's worth. Bitcoin, Bitcoin, Bitcoin. Don't ignore, it's not blockchain. I spoke to one of the profs here at the back, just before my presentation. Anyone says blockchain, walk away. Okay, let's walk away. 
Uh, just go do it with a database with some web services. It can do it better, easier. Uh, but Bitcoin, watch it, watch it, watch it. Don't underestimate it, overestimate it. This is an artificial intelligence that has now been injected into the financial services industry. It's an AI that has given us digital trust. Trust is no longer esoterical. Trust is no longer institutional. Trust is no longer government and nation states and laws. Trust is now a protocol. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's being delivered by this thing called Bitcoin. But don't look at it as Bitcoin. Look at it as a distributed ledger operated, managed by a distributed artificial intelligence. And it's incredibly powerful. Okay? I, my kids are messing a lot with it right now. I'm teaching my kids about Bitcoin on a development level what to do with it, how they play around with it, creating crypto wallets, et cetera, et cetera. I'm just, because I think that is absolutely going to be huge. Now, let's keep going. We see, you know, valuations happening. We see organizations coming that are worth a trillion dollars. I'll never forget this. On that date there, Apple broke a barrier that had never been broken before. We saw an organization that was worth one trillion U.S. dollars. This is incredible. Okay, we keep going and we see the following in our world today. We see five companies Five organizations that have more net asset value than the entire S&P 500 combined. The concentration over here of attention, the concentration of wealth, the concentration of acti human activity is incredible. We've never seen this in the history of humanity before, where five organizations have this amount of power. Right? But these organizations are metaphors of what organizations need to look like moving forward. And I've excluded people like Uber, WeWork, and some of the people that I mean, Uber is 70 something billion dollar valuation. You know, WeWork is currently at 47 billion dollar valuation, about to IPO too. We're seeing the largest organizations in the world today. Take a look at the characteristics. It's not organizations that deliver great products and services only, it's organizations that are essentially ecosystems. What makes Apple so powerful? Let me tell you what makes Apple so powerful. Is when they had the iPhone, it was pretty. Yes, it was. But you know what gave them that tectonic hockey stick? Was when we were trying to jailbreak and put our applications on it. Remember that? When people were jailbreaking the iPhone, everyone said, don't do that, don't do that. We're going to come for you. Jobs said, no, give them an API. And he gave us the Apple Store. Suddenly, the notion of a phone changed from this device that made calls and did a little bit of data, and it became an ecosystem of human augmentation. Apple suddenly had this, 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 this humanity cascading into the organization and on top of their platform to deliver services that they organically couldn't. And that value was previously unimaginable in the telephone world, and it redefined that industry. And it gave us a trillion-dollar organization. Amazon. Think about Amazon for a second. Do you think Amazon makes money off selling books or its e-store? No. Look at AWS, Amazon Web Services. It is an incredible, powerful engine. And what is AWS? AWS was just Jeff Bezos sitting down. Go get the book by Tim O'Reilly called WTF. Go see the history of Amazon in there. They sat down and they said, we've got all this ICT infrastructure. Why don't we share it? Today, Netflix runs in there. Airbnb runs in there. Keep going to the top, 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 top. Uh, ICT startups in the world run inside of AWS. Amazon has created an ecosystem of third-party human augmentation. They are not delivering services only, they're delivering this ecosystem of capability. Keep going down, uh, um, Alphabet, Google. What is Google? Come on. Google is you and I. Google is not a search engine, a spider, page rank. That was the algorithm, sure, but what gave that algorithm its data set was you and I. We search. When we look for Apple Inc. or Apple, the reason Granny Smith apples don't pop up is because everyone in this room, when they search on Apple, you're actually looking for Apple Inc., right? The page rank algorithm understood that and therefore it displays information. Where did it get it from? You and I. Google is not a business that delivers great products and services only. It delivers capability from external human augmentation. Because of the AIs that we have in our pocket. Keep going down. I mean, Microsoft is similar. Facebook. Take all our stuff out of Facebook. What would Facebook be? Think about that for a second. You take all our tweets out of Twitter. What would Twitter be? You take all our videos out of YouTube. What would YouTube be? You take all our stuff off the internet. What would Google be? 
The most valuable organizations in the world today are co-creative entities. They are not entities that only deliver great products and services. They allow for architectures of human participation. And every business and every kid that's building anything in any university needs to understand this aspect. Don't build great products and services only. Deliver ecosystems. And now I'm going to say something that's quite pivotal. There are three rules, three laws for sustainable ecosystem. The first thing is, first rule number one, everything that you make, no matter what you make, no matter who you are, make it extensible, human, augmentable. Step one, let us in. Okay? Rule number two, this is the most important rule. No matter what you make and no matter who you are, always derive less value than you establish or create. Let me say that again. Always derive less value than you create. Apple is not, its revenue per year is outstripped by the combined application revenue from third parties in its application store. Amazon combined revenue of all the people running in AWS outstrips Amazon's revenue. Keep going to every single one of these companies and you'll see that the people that they enable on aggregate coagulate all that revenue together and you see that they actually derive less value than they establish. And the third rule, and the most important rule, the second one was important, the most important one, the most, most, most important one, is the following. No matter what you make, and no matter what you do, the entire organization needs to be orchestrated by this third law, and that is empathy. Because I'll tell you something, you know what AI is doing. You know why AI is so powerful? Is because every one of us has AI. AI is not a machine in the cloud, it's a human being augmented with disparate species of intelligences capable of doing things for your organization that was previously unimaginable. Let them in. Let the disparate species of AIs outside your business in. Human-machine symbiosis is the story of AI, and that symbiosis requires you to let us in. And then you see these companies doing it, and you see valuations that are astronomical, you see capabilities that were previously unimaginable. But these organizations understand people more than they understand technology. And I know that because I've worked for one of them, right? Google understands people more than it understands technology. It's leadership. You know what social media is? You know what social media is? You know why social media is so big? You know why the predominant activity on the internet is giving, not taking? Did you know that? Over the last two years, a statistic that all of us seem to ignore, the predominant activity on the internet is not people consuming information, it's people publishing information into the cloud. It's not cloud in the sky, it's cloud in your hand. The data sitting in the internet is no longer data organizationally disseminated, distributed. It is you and I tweeting, WhatsApping, taking pictures of our, what we read, what we eat, how we feel about our spouses, how we feel, what we, we, we just constantly. When you wake up in the morning, you don't touch your spouse, you grab the glowing rectangle, right? That's the first thing you touch. It's constantly disseminated. What is going on? What is social media? Have you really lift? Don't look at social media as a, as a technology. Don't look at social media as an industry. Lift the lid and look at it from a humanities perspective and you'll start understanding it. And that's what we're going to teach our kids. You know what social media is? Let me tell you what social media is. It's you and I that's no different from the person that walked into the cave, to clay from the ground, put it in our mouth and put our hand on the wall and went, spat. Just this time, the cave's really big. That's the only difference. Because instinctively, this is what social media is. This is what you need to understand from a humanities perspective. And that's why the humanities is so important. Is understanding that people want three things. Everyone in this room wants three things. When you wake up in the morning, your first, one of the three you want is attribution. Every day you walk around during the day, you're looking for some type of attribution. You're looking for recognition. You want to be recognized. You want to have your name associated with something. Every one of you. The second thing that you're looking for every day is community. You want to feel a part of something. Purpose, a part of community, number two. And the third thing is every single one of you in this room, when you die, instinctively, what's in, in your DNA, you never want to be forgotten. Social media substrate are those three things attribution, community, and legacy. And we need to inject that, those notions into every technological excellence, engineering faculty that we can get to, to teach kids that this is about human connection. 
And when that human connection comes together with technological connection, the accentuation that occurs is stuff that like we've never imagined that before. What this? I want to say this. Um, this this one, this organization. Let me ask you a question. What killed Kodak? I say this as a lecture. I've done this lecture at Henley, Witz Business School, and Gibbs. I've done it. It's a lecture that takes like half a day, but let me quickly sum it up. Right? What killed Kodak? I love when people say, no, don't give me the answer because you steal my thunder. Um, what killed Kodak? People will say, well, it was this technology. People will say it was this movement. People will say it's that. I haven't heard any correct answer whenever I've ever asked that question because I think the answer is not a simple one. I don't think it's a thing. I'll tell you something. Take a look at Kodak. Kodak was a perfect industrial revolution business. It was a business that had a patent arsenal matched by IBM only. Every optical engineer in the world, when they graduated, wanted to go work for the big Kodak in the sky. They had a distribution network for dissemination of their technology and getting it out to you unlike any other, but they declared bankruptcy. How could Kodak die? Let me tell you what killed Kodak. Kodak was so focused on core organic capability to make the beautiful yellow camera go deep underwater to flash brighter. What they didn't understand on the outside of the organization was people were gaining, were being augmented by an AI called digital photography and having the ability to take a picture of someone's face and put it onto a social media stream to do what? To get the like button clicked. Why do you like the like button clicked? Why does it make you feel so good? When someone takes your tweet and retweets it, when someone takes your Instagram picture and hearts it, why? Why does it make? Because you know what? Those three things. You get attribution. You're feeling a part of something. And the third thing is, your wall is your cave wall. You will never be forgotten. What Kodak didn't understand, that technological transversal access on the outside, something was happening with humanity where human expression was the key factor. They focused so much on having a beautifully pixelated, high-density, mega-megapixel thing. What they didn't understand is we didn't care how pixelated the picture was. The ability to share that and have those three attributes expressed was my humanity. Humanity killed this company. This is a perfect example of leadership that only believes in hard power, thinks that it's operating margin, thinks about hiring the best only, listening to its customers, having great cultures internally and having size. None of those things are as important as co-creation. And co-creation is the notion of allowing humanity to express itself within the context of your businesses. When I stand in front of computer science students, I tell them this all the time, anything that you make, open it up so we can make it with you. Make it co-creative. Let people in, but watch your fitness functions. We've got to watch our fitness functions because it is very real that we will land up. Sorry, that's, that's just, I was going to use this as anecdotal information. It's very real that we'll land up like this. That is a very real future. Right. This is Mickey and Fantasia. Have you ever watched Fantasia? When you watch Fantasia, what happens to Mickey? He gets the wizard's book, he gets the wizard's hat, superpower. He sits down with the wizard's book. The broom comes and he tells the broom, go fetch me water. He algorithmically tells it, this is your fitness function, go fetch me water. He falls asleep, he wakes up, and what happens? He's sitting in a flood. Waves, tsunamis, he's in a vortex, and what is he doing? Trying to undo the fitness function. This is what we see happening. We're seeing leadership just in a vortex. Be careful with AI, be careful with forced industrial revolution tools, because what you ask for, you will get. You really need to understand the meaning of what you're asking for. And that meaning is so important to understand today. And that's what we've got to teach the kids that come through our tertiary educational institutes. We need to teach them the humanities because they do have a superpower. Because I can tell you something. Gattaca, I'm taking your pictures when you're in a retail store all the time. And the only reason I'm not cross-referencing that to say who you are and utilizing that is because of what? Because I'm a good guy. There's no legislation that's stopping me in South Africa. Yeah, there's no one stopping me. See, kids are going to come out of these institutions, and you have the responsibility to ensure that they understand the humanities aspect. This hard power of being great coders, great engineers, able to employ these superpowers like this kid did, we can't have millions of that running around. We can't have millions of that being the outcome. A billionaire with huge wealth concentration 
that's got access to two billion people, capable of doing things that are beautiful, but equally so, extremely dystopian. Affecting elections, affecting outcomes and opinions. We're now seeing people don't vaccinate anymore. Right? Data inside of this platform. People being elected that shouldn't be elected. Data inside of this platform. The fitness function is giving us what we asked for. We really need to think about what we actually wanted or want. That is so important today. I want to just go back to this. Um, this and I'm, two things, and I'm going to wrap up in the next uh, five, six minutes. I met this human being um, twice in my life. And it wasn't because I was something, or because I'd love to say because I knew him, and it's not at all that. I was a junior person working for Eric Schmidt when he was the CEO of Novell. I missed my flight in Michigan, and uh, the hotels were booked up, and I was just a junior guy, and I called Eric Schmidt's PA, and I said, what do I do? I'm stuck at the airport. She said, stay over at Eric's house. I said, okay. I called a cab over to Eric Schmidt's house. I got to Eric Schmidt's house, very big house, very, very big house. Biggest house I've ever been in to date. Okay, and I've been in some big houses. Uh, the gates opened up and there were sports cars and limousines all the way up the driveway and it was like a movie scene, you know, these, these limo drivers outside with the umbrellas and, and the door opened up and there was a lot of commotion. I didn't understand what was going on and I walked past with my little bags and um, uh, somebody that knew me knew, uh, went, oh, no, put down your bags, join us and I went into this massive room and inside of this room they were doing a fundraiser for Al Gore. He was running for president. I remember when he was against George Bush, and Eric Schmidt is a big Democrat. So I was there, and they put me at a table, and I was like, whoa, and I saw Bono there, and I saw Al Gore obviously there, and I was like, wow, but you know what was amazing? They put me at a table, they added me to the table, and at the table was Scott McNeely, Lo Gerstner from IBM, Larry Allison from Oracle, the HP folks, and, actually one, and then Eric, and then next to Eric was Steve Jobs, and I was at that table. And now can you understand, right? <laughs> I'm very junior, I'm not supposed to be there, and I'm sitting at this table. So you know what, Eric makes conversation at the table, and he says, where do you see the world going? Tell us where you see the world going. Scott McGilley talks about Java, 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 and I'm taking it in like, wow, wow, Java, the language, right? So, so, the Java, he was talking about Java beans then, before it even came out, and I was like, wow, wow, wow. and I thought, I'm going to take all this in and tell all my friends, and I was like, oh, he's, wow. Larry Ellison, he spoke about cloud computing before anyone else's. He, he said the network is the computer. He said that before anyone else talked about cloud. And he spoke about that at the table and oh, blew, blown away. Then the low Gerstner spoke, the IBM guy, and then the HP folks. And then we, the dinner went on. I'm, gonna paraphr I'm just going to cut it short. But yeah, long story short. Steve Jobs didn't say anything. He's quiet. Didn't say anything, right? So I'm wowed by these other folks. So Eric goes back to Steve and says, Steve, you didn't say anything. Where do you see the world going and what's your take? And you know what? He sits back. He looks up and he says, I believe people are inherently good, not inherently evil. So I said to go, <laughs> this guy's a dog. <laughs> no wonder he only wears like a black polo neck and jeans. Right? And I left there and I was disappointed. I thought he was the biggest idiot that I'd ever met. I actually told people that. I said, Steve Jobs overrated. No wonder they fired him that time. And no wonder. Da, da, da. And I, I, that was what I was saying in conversations. And I, was, I kept on speaking in Moscow. But you know what? Not too long after that, Rolling Stone magazine article. He's sitting barefoot on the cover. He announces iTunes. He went to record label companies and he said, your business models suck and that's the reason piracy exists. Not because people are bad. And I can prove it to you. If you tell people 12 tracks when they only wanted one and you tell them they can only play it on these things, you know what happens? Pirate Bay, Napster, et cetera, et cetera. But people are inherently good. Give them something fairly priced with flexibility and you'll redefine your industry. And guess what? A third of all the music up until two years ago was being bought inside of iTunes. The technology of iTunes was led by somebody that understood people more than they understood technology. Go look at the, the, the Malcolm Gladwell wrote a eulogy for him in the New Yorker. Go read that. He said he was a tinkerer. He didn't understand tech very well. He understood people more. And that's what we need. We need organizations. And take a look at, at that table. Look at the history of the organizations at the table. Look at where those leaders are today. Look at who they are today, and then take a look at the valuations of the company and their impact on humanity. Then you understand it is about understanding people more than it is about understanding these hardcore powers that we now have. And that's the message. It's a humanity message. It is not a technological message. You as leaders, you that are teaching leaders, need to teach them that when they look over their firewalls on the outside, they shouldn't see competition. They, shouldn't see, they should see latent human capacity, symbiotically augmented and extended with artificial intelligence with 
that being cascaded into the organizations, giving them capabilities that was previously unimaginable. And here's an unimaginable capability, Uber. What is Uber? Now, I built a little diagram that talks about the, uh, a business model or map for the next economy. Organizations today, let's get less esoterical and humanities and bohemian, right? Let's talk a little bit more engineering-like. Organizations today need to be not organizations that deliver products and services. I think what we need, and I'm going to term it this, algorithmic marketplaces. I think whatever you do and whoever you're teaching, you need to teach them the new organization business model of today moving forward because of the fourth industrial revolution is what I call a marketplace, but it's an algorithmic marketplace. It's not a marketplace in the, in the sense, in the generic sense. It's an algorithmic marketplace. And if you, let's map this model to this. If you take a look at Uber, right? Uber is a company that is a company that pretty much owns nothing. They don't own the car, they don't own the phone, they don't employ the driver, they don't own the SIM, they don't own the network, they don't own anything. Airbnb doesn't own the facility, doesn't own the phone, doesn't own the that, they don't own anything. Keep going. What we see happening is organizations that are accentuated by algorithms. When you go work for Uber, now think about it. I mean, if I told you 10 years ago a service would come along where you open up your phone and you could gain access to um, a cab within five minutes, you would say, wow, so you're going to make an app for a cab company. That's Taxify. It's really cool. But that is taking an app and putting it on top of a taxi company. Uber's not that. You know how Uber works? And what very few people understand about Uber is how the Uber driver app works. Then you understand how Uber works. When an Uber driver comes to Uber, and he's not a driver yet, a Zambian guy, never been in South Africa before, doesn't know the maps, knocks on Uber's door, says, I've got a Toyota Corolla, I've got a working permit. They do a background check. He leaves the Uber office with the Uber driver app installed for him. He gets into the car, click, and suddenly that thing says, go stand here to catch rides in the quickest amount of time. And I'm going to tell you how to get there in the quickest amount of time too. He doesn't have to understand how Joburg works. He doesn't have to understand the traffic patterns at all. Who does that driver work for? He doesn't work for Uber. He works for Uber's algorithm. He clocks in when he wants, clocks out when he wants. Right? You know how surge works. You know how surge pricing in Uber works. Sometimes you catch an Uber, you see they strike out the price and they show you a higher price, right? You know why? Because the algorithm predictively says where the density of people that are put predictably going to ask for a ride increases and the drivers in that area is at a particular threshold that's lower, it increases the price like the honeybee effect happens, the drivers come closer and it equalizes the surge pricing and it flattens out again. That is not done by any human being inside of Uber. That is done by Wu, you and me running the Uber app as passengers, the drivers and where their location and an algorithm with data that's predictive, seasonal in the sky. That is a metaphor for the new organization moving forward. We need algorithmic marketplaces. And algorithmic marketplaces is a combination of me on your business, outside your business, you delivering platforms and services, and all the, the, the core outcomes, all augmented, all coagulated and orchestrated by a machine, an algorithmic marketplace of location data being shared, opinions being shared, ratings being shared, and then you deliver a service that was previously unimaginable. I mean, Uber's going so far, they like Lyft. Guess what? The drivers that have X amount of rides um, uh, and ratings, they can actually sign up other drivers. Where they don't even sign up other drivers anymore. The drivers sign up other drivers on their behalf. Because there's a trust rating inside of the system. That's an incredible organization. That's a metaphor for the new way businesses will be done. It's human-machine symbiosis, and that together gives us stuff that was previously unimaginable. Thanks so much for your time today. Appreciate it. <laughs> questions? I think we're going to do questions, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, we'll take just two questions. Yes. Um, Orla? Uh, there's a microphone behind you. Thank you, that was really, can you hear me? 
Yeah. Um, I don't think the mic's on. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Uh, that was amazing. Thank you Thank so you. much. Yeah. Um, I really want to talk to you afterwards and bring you to another forum, if I can <laughs> afford you. I'm not sure how good right. that free thing is at the beginning. Um, I just wanted to ask, do you think that this era is going to bring the end of privacy? Okay. Should we do another question or should I take... Okay, so whoever has got another question, maybe just sim on that. Um, I'm going to go back to what Steve Jobs said. I believe people are inherently good, not inherently evil. I, I think that... Um, piracy, no, privacy, um, I just want you to know right now, privacy is a myth, as you're sitting there right now. I think uh, if you have a bank card and you're in the formal economy and you do electronic transactions, you don't have privacy, and if you're in social media, even more so. But let, let's not be cynical. I think where privacy becomes very interesting is when I take the inside swab of your cheek. You know, I've got the power that 23andMe has, and I disseminate your, gen, you know, your gene types, and I look at your macro card, so I, all I need to do is hack your macro card and see what groceries you bought for the last 12 months. I see your gene type, and then I correlate, and I go, you have the probability of these diseases. And then when you go for medical insurance, Discovery says, we'll cover you for everything, but not these types of diabetes and that, and you won't know why and how. That's the danger. That's where I don't have answers for you. That's where the Europeans are very good. And the European model, the GDPR models and stuff that they, you know, I'm now doing business in Europe, and GDPR, which is their practice for privacy and data protection around consumers, it's the most mature that I've seen. But we do have a challenge. Our leadership hasn't caught up to where these tools are. And that's why I do believe that it's superpowers that we need to be careful. We need the students that are coming out of your institutions need to be taught morals, ethics, humanity, goodness, kindness, and be given that, not just on this esoterical stuff. And that's why I said the three things that makes a business, right, is build ecosystems, derive less value than you create, and the third thing was what? Love. Every leader needs to understand love. He needs to understand empathy. And that's on that three substrates, right? And one recognition, attribution, I want to feel a part of, and I, and I never want to be forgotten. Those are the elements of love, and I think that's what we need to teach our leaders, and that's what we need to teach um, the emerging class of humans with all this power that you're giving them. You're teaching them computer science, you're teaching them engineering, and I think we really need to blend these skills with the humanities, else we will have outcomes like I've just described. So, so it's not one simple, and that's why I joined the CSIR, and that's why I am an advisor in the presidency. And what I'm speaking about there all the time is the humanities aspect of things. I'm the person in the room that talks less about technology than anyone else. Because I am worried. And I think our leaders need to understand these things. right? And not be scared by them, but really see them as opportunities. I, do, I honestly believe that, that it's a beautiful thing that's happening. It's an amazing thing, and we need to look at it that way. We, we will be able to do things that we just couldn't do before. But, yeah, we could destroy ourselves by this. Yeah. With um, everything that you've learned and know and experienced, how do you think that's going to impact the tertiary education sector? And do you think universities are an ecosystem? No, they're not. So I'll, I'll speak from my... Um, I'm on the board of Advertech, and we have private universities. You know, we've got Varsity College, etc. I, I do think the way we teach kids today is not the way kids will be taught in the future. I think the curriculum, especially in the sciences and the engineering, is not keeping up, and those are things that you folks know. I think there's an opportunity to deliver what you're delivering in a different way, but that's the stuff that you folks know already. Um, I just see more and more, I mean, I take a look at my kids, a lot of the knowledge that they actually will employ um, in the real world, they don't get taught that in school at all. You know? um, imagination is not a thing that we measure in school. Um, you know, project management is not taught in school. Um, um, uh, yeah, and I always look at how companies formulate. You know, the most successful companies are, is a coagulation of disparate skills. You know, you need, a, you need a poet, you need an evangelist, you need a scribe, you need a mathematician, you need a scientist. And if you have a combination of that, then you've got a beautiful thing, right? Not your product, it's your team. And I think we need to teach more of those things. And I think people come out of your institutions and they don't know where to go. And I think those jobs, the way they're defined today, won't be there. So the people that you're skilling up, where are they going to work? That's an interesting thing. Now, I don't worry about it. 
because I don't think it's going to be only up to you. The notion of having to go to university and therefore have this outcome in your life is gone now. Knowledge is freely available. You don't have to go to a physical institution. I can go to MIT and go to most of the courses, Stanford's most of the courses online. I think education is just self-drive and motivation, positivity and attitude. That's what education actually is. Um, and, I, and it's going to be interesting to see how you folks metamorphosize yourselves. But at the end of the day, education still has a play. Because teaching is not just knowledge. Jo Professor Jonathan Janssen taught me something about education over the last five and a half years, being on the board of Advertech with him. He said, education is a human story. It's not, this, it's not textbooks in that. You know, a teacher, an educator, somebody that is a social worker, it's a doctor, it's a psychologist, it's a therapist, that's actually, because it sees that that person is malnutrition, it sees that that person just got abused in a particular way, it deals with so many other things that is unwritten, and that's actually education. And it's a calling. And so that part of it I understand too. But the pure knowledge availability and accessibility, yeah, that's, that's changing. I mean, I don't think you're going to have to do it. And I'll just give you something that's anecdotal, but you know, if you take a look at the architecture of the internet, today it's a privilege-based architecture. It's very pheromonic, right? It's the largest copy machine in the entire world <laughs> that we've ever created, the way the protocols work. But you need a thin client, a fat pipe, and a thick cloud, right? Because that's how we kind of get it. I think it's going to change. I think the architecture of the internet will become more osmotic. What I mean by that is um, uh, the storage capacity on devices. You see a device like an, uh, you know, you take a look at an iPod, it will be this size, right? And it'll have the capacity, like the biggest iPod today, I don't know, it's like 100 plus gig. Right? It can store today 17, 18 years of non-stop music on it. The next one, in the next, um, so, so there's a law, there's a storage law. Every 13 months, storage capacity doubles and form factor stays the same. Right? I can never remember the professor, but I know the law. Um, so if that's the case, the next iPod will store one year video, a single handheld device, 365 times 24 hours. The next one after that will store um, all music ever generated by mankind, ever, on a single handheld device. The one that after that, will store 84 to 85 years of video. And the one after that, then that, I'm talking about like one year, two years, three. in the next five years, we will have the capability to have a device in our hand that has the entire snapshot of all the data on all, on all the applications on the internet in our hand. And I think what will change is, we won't go to the internet, it will perpetually be there. It won't be a thing that we access, it will be ambiently available. And you will, you will buy something, you will buy a car and it will have a snapshot of the entire internet in it. It won't be the internet of things, it will be the internet in things. Your clothing, your, your, we can keep going down the road with biology, being augmented, protein cells, with data. And I think that's going to change. And I think when that changes, the education sector will be deeply impacted because I think knowledge, data, information won't be a thing that when you go to an institution, you get it and your physical proximity, it will be a thing that is transversely, ambiently there. <clears throat> so I think education right now is attitude and stuff. Okay, I'm gonna, uh, thank you. Thank you, so thank you very much. much. Thank you very much, Stefan. That was very thought-provoking. <laughs>